Ode on Melancholy by John Keats. So, the first thing to say about an ode is that it is a song of praise, a poem of celebration, which usually focuses on one particular theme or object. It can be a bit boring and it can be very formal. It can be dum de dum a bit like a limerick, but not in this case, obviously, because it's Keats. Um, but it is a song of praise. He wrote several odes and he discussed various aspects of the theme or object that he was discussing, or in the uh, case of Ode to Autumn, the season that he was discussing. Uh, so that's the first thing to know about an ode, the first thing you can say. The next thing to say is that whenever you're approaching a poem, there's a strategy that can help you when you first look at a poem, even if it's an unseen one. And the first part of that is rhyme scheme. Check what the rhyme scheme is. Is it uh, blank verse? Does it not rhyme at all? Does it rhyme every two lines? All sorts of rhyme schemes are out there and some are formal and some are informal. Now you can see that this one is more formal. This is the way you annotate a rhyme scheme by alphabetically ordering the rhyme. So A, B, A, B, C, C, D, C, C, and where's the other one? D, kind of. So an owl and soul might be a bit forced. Um, berries and bee might be a bit forced as well. It's not quite as formal as one or two of the others, but it is quite a task to make everything rhyme. And in fact, in that line, nor, de nor the death moth bee is a bit of an inversion of words in order to get some kind of rhyme with e of eaves of berries. So it is quite formal. And that gives you something to say straight up. Then you might want to look at meter, which basically means beat. How many syllables are there in a, a line? In this case, it's 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, lethe, probably seven, eight, nine, ten. Yes, it's 10 if you go lethe or letha. Five pairs. And that usually means iambic pentameter. So once you've looked at rhyme scheme, meter, you can then start to draw conclusions about what form the poem is in. The rhyme scheme hints at a sonnet, but because it's a ten line stanza and there are three stanzas in this poem, then it's not a sonnet as such, because a sonnet is a 14 line poem that is only one stanza long and has a, a variety of forms beyond that, eight and six or three, fours and two. But it fundamentally, the rhyme scheme and the metre would suggest it's a bit like a sonnet. So he's combining the idea of an ode with the idea of a sonnet in the form of this poem. So now you've had a look at what the strategy is, rhyme scheme, metre and form, you can start discussing what's in the poem. And Leith, Leithy is, or Leitha, is an underworld river. So now we're sort of going towards the classical mythology that Keats used a lot, although he's not going to stick with that, because the next thing he asks, talks about, is wolfsbane, which is a plant that was once used to poison wolves, hence bane. It is the bane of wolves' lives. And this is also quite a... Um, declarative start. No, no, go not to Leith, neither twist wolf bane tight listed for its poisonous wine. So you could sort of guess from that that he's advising the reader not to descend to the underworld, not to be tempted by poison. So this is quite depressing, but then it is an ode on melancholy. So it's likely to be about how you feel when you feel melancholic or depressed. And he carries on with this theme. Nor suffer thy pale forehead to be kissed by nightshade, which of course, as we know, is deadly. Ruby grape of Proserpine, which is another name for Persephone, the goddess of the underworld and death. So he's making a list of poisons. Make not your rosary of yew berries. Yep, that would be also poison you, nor let the beetle nor the death moth be your mournful psyche. The scarab beetle that you might be more familiar with from films like The Mummy, but it was placed 
in the tombs of the pharaohs. That's why it appears in Disney horror films or such like horror films as a signifier. So he carries on with these symbols of death, the beetle, the death moth, which has, I think it has a skull on it. When you look at the moth, it looks like a skull. He carries on with the downy owl. In a lot of cultures, the downy owl is a symbol of death, not always of wisdom, but sometimes of death. And all of this is referring to how melancholy makes you feel. Suicidal, basically, your mournful psyche. Psyche was the wife of Cupid, whose path to love was not all that easy and was doomed to wander and, and make a few mistakes in her life. For shade to shade will come too drowsily and drown the wakeful anguish of the soul. So if you follow all this, if you he's saying initially, no, no, go not to Lethe. And, and at the end of the stanza, the last two lines say, if you do this, shade to shade will come too drowsily and drown the wakeful anguish of the soul. So all of this stanza is about staying alert, keeping away from things that might cause you to fall into death because you are melancholy. In the second stanza, uh, he talks about when the melancholy fit shall fall, uh, and which suggests it can be quite sudden and you can suddenly find yourself in this dark uh, place, sudden from heaven like weeping cloud. So it's quite a strong image of, of the way depression might visit people and how they have to, to deal with it. Sudden from heaven like a weeping cloud, we've got a simile there, that fosters the droop-headed compound adjective flowers all, and that is wolf's bane again, that is how they look, and hides the green in an April shroud, which is perhaps more metaphoric, the idea that, the mist on the hills hides the beauty of the green of spring, so you don't see what's really there. Then glut thy sorrow on a morning rose. Be greedy, wallow in it, is the idea here, which, which is uh, perhaps a, a metaphor for self-pity. That's actually what melancholy can do. He, he then moves on to the idea of the temporary that the rainbow and the salt sand wave are, are temporary. The rainbow goes, the, the salt sand wave disappears under the sea. Or on the wealth of globed peonies, a beautiful flower, which is actually I think is quite notorious for flowering and being over really quickly. All these things fade fast. So he's sort of saying, but when the melancholy fit shall fall sudden from heaven like a weeping cow that fosters the droop-headed flowers, that, that makes you think about all the things in the first stanza, and you kind of are greedy with self-pity. Remember that this too shall pass, this is temporary. But the when the melancholy fit shall fall sudden from heaven like a weeping cloud, it is then very difficult to see Clearly, so you focus, you glut thy sorrow on everything that fades, that is temporary. All beauty goes, it's all just so depressing. And then he refers directly, or if thy mistress some rich anger shows, so even if your wife or lover is cross with you, that assumes a greater importance than perhaps it needs to. This also assumes that he's talking to a male reader and that he does actually have a real mistress. Imprison her soft hand, let her rave and feed deep, deep upon her peerless eyes. There's a lot of assonance there, the repetition of the vowel, which again is really talking about sinking into this, this melancholy, oh, she's cross with me and I'm, you know, there's nothing I can do about it. She's just going to be angry with me, so I'm just going to bathe in it and, and all the misery that is around me. And then it carries on with the temporariness of beauty. She dwells with beauty, beauty that must die. So, you know, now he's in a really bad mood. Not only is everything around him not as beautiful as it could be and everything around him is temporary, but his mistress, who is beautiful, won't always be beautiful. What a terrible thought. And Joy, whose hand is ever at his lips bidding adieu, adieu again, can't really get through an ode without mentioning adieu. Again, that kind of romantic sense to it and aching pleasure and I turning to poison while the bee mouth sips. I think there he, he's juxtaposing the pleasure of love and the way it can fade and become temporary itself. And he uses the metaphor of the poison while the bee mouth sips. Uh, that compound adjective is sort of 
sh shrinking the line for the meter so that he can fit iambic pentameter. And it's probably referring to the duality of a bee. A bee is a beautiful thing that creates wonderful honey, but can also sting and poison if it needs to. So it has that duality of pleasure and pain. I, in the very temple of delight, here he kind of makes melancholy divine, gives it a, a, a personification, if you like. Veiled melancholy has her sovereign shrine. So this is this depression is is sacred in some way, and perhaps again that's quite a good description of of how melancholy people feel that once once they become depressed and it, it's it, it's a sacred thing to be depressed. It's important to be depressed. It dominates and changes life and and seems to have its own life and its own personality. Though seen of none save him whose strenuous tongue can burst joy's grape against his palate fine. So though seen of none save him, save, that doesn't mean save him in the sense of saving, that means accept him whose strenuous tongue can burst joy's grape against his palate fine. So it's not seen by many this sovereign melancholy, except those who are able to destroy joy just by bursting it like a grape against the tongue, um, which is quite a strong image. His soul shall taste the sadness of her might, so like once you've burst, burst a grape, you taste it, and be among her cloudy trophies hung. It's quite a, a gory finish, that, the idea that melancholy claims him hangs him up on the wall with all the other trophies that she's got, the people that she's claimed, who perhaps end up dead because they have given in to and gone into the underworld, crossed into the river and embraced death because of their depression. It is a melancholic poem. <laughs>